Thank you, thank you, uh, Ms. Rosalind. Uh, good evening, uh, colleagues. Uh, welcome to this, uh, okay, protocols remains observed. Uh, welcome to this uh, talk book series. And uh, as uh, Rosalind said, uh, we shall be discussing uh, a book entitled uh, The Cyber Security Playbook, uh, authored by uh, Alison Serra. And just to give you a summary of the book, uh, The Cyber Security Playbook, authored by Alison, offers uh, a practical and uh, actionable guidance for leaders and employees to enhance organizations' uh, cyber security posture. Uh, the book combines uh, a personal short story, industry uh, insights, and as well a structured framework called the wisdom. So the wisdom, when we talk about the wisdom, we refer to what will, what will you say or do differently every Monday. Yeah, so when later on we talk about a wisdom from uh, any of the chapters, we're referring to what you'll say or do differently on Mondays. Yeah, and uh, the book also provides a comprehensive approach to cybersecurity. And uh, briefly, that is uh, the summary of the book. And uh, going deep down into the discussion again. We know it's a fact that the hackers, or we call them the cyber criminals, they always target witting employees or unforgettable employees, in that case I can say, to unleash havoc or maybe try to breach uh, any kind of uh, organization or companies. Uh, all we see as one, we also, uh, you know, uh, be able to face that kind of risk in the coming uh, uh, days or months. So it's worth for us to, you know, inform ourselves uh, and build a comprehensive approach of cyber security for us to safeguard our data and our information in the organization. Now, uh, statistically, in Africa, Africa had uh, data bridges in between 2022 to 2023. Uh, there are major uh, cyber security threats, mainly to mention we have AU. I think when we just joined in, we heard on the news, AU has been breached. And we also had uh, Kenya government system and as well uh, uh, Nigerian electoral commission systems have been breached in 2023. And others such as the CPIC, a bridge in South Africa, which was not long enough. It, is, uh, it occurred in February 2024. Cybersecurity continues to be uh, a major issue in Africa. It's not that major compared to the North, but it's coming up. And uh, we should be vigilant with a monthly statistics of bridge uh, reported 150 uh, in 2024, which is in the early months and uh, up from uh, an average of up to uh, 56 per month in 2023. So meaning we have experienced a surge or an increase in uh, uh, data bridges or uh, cyber security threats according to one of the South African information regulations. And um, as well reported by uh, Google H1, it's um, a platform that reports uh, Google, th uh, sorry, cyber threats uh, globally, and they reported uh, in 2024 that uh, cyber threats have increased in both numbers and sophistications and have targeted all IT environments, meaning uh, as like in our OEC office, the on-premises uh, uh, is, uh, you know, entitled to such kind of risks. We also have our mobile phones and uh, we have what we call the IoT devices. So these are devices that we are connected on the are connected on the internet, and we use it to quickly do something. We uh, of late we know of fridges, or maybe air conditioners, door lockers connected to the internet. So these are IoT devices, 
And we also have cloud platforms. Many of us use um, emails on Google's or on any other uh, 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 cloud service. So the report found that issues specific to cloud providers were often due to companies' negligence or in hygiene in terms of their security uh, configurations. Uh, and rather, rather underlying, say, maybe if there is any vulnerability in the system, as opposed to that, they have a weakness in misconfiguration as opposed to uh, having uh, uh, vulnerabilities in their system. Now, unlike other books, uh, this cybersecurity playbook authored by Allison explores um, you know, the non-technical aspect. So other books you might have seen in the library gives you a technical, tells you how to hack, how you can be able to safeguard your uh, network environment and all that. But unlike for this book specifically, it gives us a non-technical understanding of what cybersecurity is. So to a layman who doesn't know what cybersecurity is, you as a person who doesn't know what cybersecurity is, at the end of this uh, talk book series, you should be able to give, uh, or maybe you should be able to understand exactly what cybersecurity is. Yeah? Now, um, the book as well uh, gives, uh, or oh, it breaks or fills the gap in, uh, in the literature offering uh, a practical non-technical guide for board executive managers and even as the employees. Now, this book mainly, uh, authored by Allison, is, uh, the story comes from a company called McAfee. If we've ever used antivirus called McAfee, we know that this is, at one moment, this was a big security a company that offered this tool to protect us from cyber threats. And they do a lot of uh, protection to government offices, organizations, and even consumers as who install these uh, antiviruses on our laptops. Now, this whole of this story in this book has been gathered through McAfee uh, uh, questionnaires uh, shared to McAfee staffs and as well uh, some key um, companies. Uh, to answer some of the security questionnaires to be able to come up with a detailed uh, content of this book. Now, uh, this book also exposes or uh, explores the step-by-step -step procedure uh, and it outlines an action plan for integrating proven uh, security uh, habits into everyday business operations. Uh, similarly, as well in uh, OEC, through this guide, we should be able to implement it and protect ourselves from uh, cyber threats. Yeah, uh, so uh, it's as to uh, as uh, the employees to be able to take this guide and be able to implement it, to be able to, uh, you know, uh, practice or maybe uh, be able to develop a culture of security within the organization and keep hackers or the criminals, or we call them the, the, the cyber criminals, out of our reach into our data and all our systems. So drawing on the author's experience and interviews with a wide range of company leaders and uh, employees, the cybersecurity playbook provides a jargon free, so meaning all in our discussions, we're not going to mention for you those jargons uh, in IT or in cybersecurity but rather to give you, it, uh, you know, a simple understanding of the keywords that we're talking about or that relates to cybersecurity. Now, um, in addition, the book details specific strategies for personnel at every level. So this book is very key to everyone in all the departments, regardless of whether you're a HR person, whether you're from Pure, whether you're from tied, developing an app. So this details all the procedures that you need to follow to be able to develop uh, a, a, a culture of uh, cyber security in the organization. Yeah. And um, again, the book is loaded with practical prescription for uh, how every employee 
and leader can adopt a sound cybersecurity behavior. Uh, the book again moves this complex topic of cybersecurity that we hear every time from a theory to action. So it's uh, going to detail for us some uh, actions that we should be able to take in case of any uh, cyber threat. Um, now, our, su our suggestions require more work, but ultimately work the effort. In addition, the book is filled with illustrative real examples that crystallizes cybersecurity procedures. Now, the book is, is an invaluable guide again, I'll stress this, to identify security gaps in our organization and getting buy-ins from the top management uh, and promoting uh, effective daily cybersecurity routines and safeguarding vital resources. A, a robust cybersecurity posture is no longer um, a simple in hand of ITs. Yeah? It becomes overwhelming for the IT departments to, you might be thinking as an IT department you have all the the guides, or, or you have all the applications, or you have all the hardwares to protect our data or uh, protect our systems, but it's just an action from one employee, as I mentioned before, a witting, unwitting employee, who forgot that at one moment he or she was taught to first check on any kind of phishing emails before they click. Yeah, so by that kind of action from this unwitting employee can cause a havoc. However much billions you have put onto resources to be able to protect the, the data of, a, of an organization, with that simple action, uh, an organization can be compromised in a few seconds. Yeah? So, um, talking about the author, Sarah has been a marketing person. She's not, <clears throat> she was not a cybersecurity person, but what she did tremendously is to be able to gather information from relevant employees and as well uh, companies, yeah, or CISOs, we call them the chief uh, information security officers. Yeah? So throughout this, uh, questionnaires or data that she collected, she managed to uh, be able to put down all this uh, content into a book that we are discussing today. So uh, Sarah joined the cybersecurity industry as a marketeer with enough knowledge about technology trends, yeah? talking about uh, cloud computing, mobile devices, or, uh, uh, you know, uh, many of the ERP systems and all that, she has uh, an in-depth knowledge about this system. So what she does is, uh, what she did, sorry, is to be able to get this knowledge and be able to question most of the uh, industry uh, guys who should be able to answer some of the questions that helped her uh, come up with this book. Now, um, as I said before, this book is going to give us a non-technical guide for defending our, uh, our organizations from uh, hackers. So if generally you are a non-technical person, as I said before, be rest assured that at the end of this, you will be able to understand clearly or you'll be educated on uh, uh, every ounce of cybersecurity or you'll know uh, what cybersecurity entails at the end of this. So. Um, I will also provide some prescriptions and uh, my colleague will as well give you guys some wisdoms on um, how to be able to uh, uh, practice a culture of uh, cyber security in the organization. Yeah? So uh, through this book, from chapter one, we have about 10 chapters from the book. And from chapter one up to the last has a couple of wisdoms that we should be able to uh, get from this uh, book. But uh, I know due to time, we, uh, we're not going to be able to go through all the books, all the chapters, but I've selected some key uh, chapters to discuss, and um, my colleague will as well be able to give his reflections and uh, wisdom to uh, the listeners. So from chapter one, 
we know or we hear every time on news that uh, organizations or companies get breached or get hacked or your friend or colleague, your neighbor has been hacked. We hear that a lot, yeah? The ever-increasing connectivity of modern organizations and uh, the heavy use of cloud-based solutions continue to uh, present a unique challenge to the IT uh, department. Data bridges, malicious uh, software infections, and cyber attack costs uh, organizations time, money, and reputation, yeah? And uh, the cybersecurity playbook is a non-technical guide for us uh, to enhance our organization at all, uh, our cybersecurity at uh, the organization. And uh, it provides or presents us, uh, you know, those kind of guides that we should be able to understand and practice to be able to uh, safeguard our uh, uh, IT resources and as well uh, data, yeah. Uh, so from uh, chapter one, the author managed to uh, put a nice story of uh, how McAfee was hacked and um, she entitled the chapter one as the time I ruined Easter. So just as you breaking out on Friday, saying you're happily going for Easter break, what happened was that McAfee uh, had a breach. Uh, one of their social media platforms has been defaced by a hacker, yeah? So uh, in this chapter, Alison recounts a personal experience handling this sig significant attack onto uh, uh, McAfee on Easter, yeah? Highlighting the importance of rapid response or preparedness. So the theme generally in the chapter one is to prepare us, yeah, on how we can be able to safeguard our social media platforms and how are we prepared to, um, you know, face any kind of attack that comes to us and most importantly, on a day that you feel you're going to rest, but you get encountered with such a, a scenario or incident. So the best way to do is we should be able to have a plan or a preparedness plan that will help us, you know, quickly uh, uh, be able to uh, sort such kind, such kind of uh, issues out. Now, chapter one opens a personal uh, story, as I said before, Alison was narrating illustrating the importance of prompt and effective uh, response to uh, uh, the incident that occurred. The author also uh, uh, recounts an incident where McAfee social media was hacked, f defacing the company profile. And uh, now what happened is after the incident response investigation was is that one of the employee uh, we call them a disgruntled employee who was working for McAfee, left the organization. But what happened is there was no clear, um, uh, we call it out checking out of the employee. So in terms of um, checking out an employee who is leaving the company, there should be a procedure where the employee follows the procedures through the HR and be able to finally check out through the IT. So what happened is this employee was not checked out and uh, what happened is this employee was responsible or she was an admin of one of the uh, social media accounts. And um, now what happened is the organization was not part of, was not a target. But what happened, happened is, is that the attacker was trying to compromise this individual who doesn't now work for the organization, yeah? So what happened is during this process of the hack, the attacker managed to land into a login of the organization, yeah? Because this user is still active, meaning she's still an admin on the, on the what? On the social media platform for McAfee. So the attack escalated and uh, what the attacker did was to uh, deface the website or deface the social media platforms. And uh, what he did is he needs, the attacker managed to, they're kind of having a battle between two admins. 
Now, after Alison realizing that uh, the social media platform has been hacked, she raised the alarm and uh, at least few of the staffs from the marketing department and all that came in to investigate what the issue is. So one of the social media uh, uh, manager who works in the marketing department was able to go into the social media and tries to delete the posts. So this hacker or this attacker went ahead into posting malicious content into the uh, social media. So his work was before he could do anything, he thought of not tarnishing the reputation of the organization, so he continues to delete. The moment he deletes, the hacker puts it back. Yeah. So the next uh, action he did was to go and log out any admin. Yeah. Before he could do that, the hacker already took control of the what? The page. So he was locked out, and the next minute, the logo for the for the company has been changed to a pawn, yeah, kind of. And it was really a hectic day for all the team. They managed to communicate back and forth with the CEO and the, the authorities. But again, uh, they have nothing to do at that moment. So uh, in our preparedness plan as an organization, all the company should have had series of best practices they should have done. One of them is making sure we check out employees who had access to our systems. And secondly, we should have a clear guiding uh, response plan that will help us, you know, alert one or two guys or one or two people who manages these platforms. And again, one uh, weakness that was found out from this hack was that the admins did not uh, activate what we call the multiple factor authentication. Meaning if you need to uh, authenticate to a, a Facebook page, besides the username and password, you should be able to enter a code. They didn't have uh, that kind of mechanism. So it made it easier for the attacker to be able to gain access to uh, this site by just getting access to the password that was hacked from uh, this disgruntled employee. Yeah. So that was the brief uh, story behind uh, chapter one. And uh, in brief, it gives us uh, a wisdom that we should focus on the importance of rapid response and as well maintain security or companies' integrity during crisis. Yeah? And the book, uh, the book Stone emphasizes that uh, we should be ready for any kind of cyber attack. Regardless of, we never know the next day we should do. At OEC, our website might be hacked. Our LinkedIn page might be defaced and all that. So we should have that mindset to be ready to uh, respond to any kind of, uh, to respond to any kind of uh, cyber threat coming to us. And uh, that's briefly about uh, chapter one. Uh, I, I chose key uh, chapters because it gives a lot of thorn to us to understand and be able to practice uh, or pra uh, have a, uh, you know, a hygiene of cyber security within the organization. Now, chapter two um, is entitled Mr. or Miss, Miss Cellopane. Yeah, so the whole Cellopane idea is is one of the, uh, I think the names given to one of the renowned artists or something. But in the story, it happens that uh, one of the, uh, could I say, one of the uh, uh, people written in this book, uh, it has been reported that this guy has been dating the wife for quite some time. And uh, he knows that the wife doesn't cheat. But what happened is this wife uh, went and cheated and got involved with another man. And what happened is again is that this woman went and killed the ex uh, the, 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 the boyfriend that he found. Now this guy who is the ex ex husband has to defend how uh, the wife, yeah? So this story relates to any cyber, uh, uh, any uh, cyber security 
or the IT departments who are here to defend us. They put much effort to be able to safeguard us from any kind of threats. Now, they welcome any kind of garbage. They welcome any kind of, they will, who could say they will take a bullet for your case because you are the wrong person who went ahead and caused a bridge in an organization, but they are there to support or maybe see how they can fix out that issue, yeah? So um, the theme for this chapter is mainly the role of what we call the CISOs or the, uh, the cyber security or chief information security officers. For our organization, we know it's the chief of section for uh, IT and uh, information security. Now, this uh, theme uh, gives us a visibility uh, into uh, cyber security. The chapter focuses on uh, the often overlooked role of cyber security or cyber security personnel within our organizations. So what happens here is, is that we most times overlook the roles that these IT guys played for us in our organization. They will be able to implement something that will protect us, but we rather take it negatively, thinking that it will be affecting our work. By simply asking you to change your password, or maybe uh, asking you to uh, uh, enable multiple factor authentication, most staff think that that is a big work for them to do, or an, uh, a work for them to do that. It makes the IT department uh, look like people who bring burden to the rest, yeah? So their roles are always uh, underlooked. And then um, we also need to recognize their efforts. Just relating to the story about how a man was able to defend uh, the woman, much as the woman is guilty of murder of the, the boyfriend, yeah? So it's that kind of scenario that the IT people take into uh, them to be able to safeguard us or control or, or any kind of burden we put onto the organization in terms of hack. They take the burden to see that this is fixed. Yeah. So we should always be able to recognize their roles uh, in the organization. So um, again, the wisdom from this uh, chapter uh, gives us the highlights, highlights for us the need for visibility and support for organizations, uh, cyber security personnel. We should be able to adapt to their needs or we should be able to uh, respond to their calls. If they send you a guide on you sh how to change your passwords or how to enable your multiple factor authentication, please bear with them and be able to uh, uh, accord this uh, or maybe do as they, they, they instructed. Reason being, they are just there to help you take any bullet, yeah? Meaning uh, they are there to protect us from any kind of cyber threat. So whatever strategies they bring in is uh, to help us uh, safeguard our data or our infrastructures. Now the last part of this uh, discussion for now is I'll talk about uh, is chapter three, uh, entitled as Good Morning, This is Your Wake Up Call. Now, uh, from this chapter, they, uh, the author also puts, uh, has put for us some nice story of how uh, one of the HR personnel was sent a phishing email. When I talk about a phishing email, is in simple term, I could say, an email sent by an attacker. It could be through email or for, uh, messages or through any social media. So these messages are there to impersonate or they are there to cause malicious havoc to you. So an attacker sent an email to one of the HR uh, personnel asking them to update a payroll or something. And in that email, unfortunately, there was a link. Yeah. And what this HR person uh, did was, he or she was a little bit curious of why this person would be asking that detail or why that person would be asking for that information or requesting for update about payroll. 
and then sending a link to click on something. So what this HR person did was quickly had to call the real person working for the organization. So let's say the HR, the, the person who is, has been impersonated is Alison, who is the author of this book. And uh, the HR managed to call her on, you know, a separate, before responding to any of the emails, she uh, managed to call Alison and asked her whether she sent an email detailing things like, you know, payroll and all that. Then uh, only to realize that it wasn't her and uh, someone impersonated her. So the whole of this story uh, gives us a wake-up call that you should always be vigilant. Do not act on something quick. Yeah, You might end up compromising or you might end up causing havoc for the whole organization by just simply clicking a link or a phishing email that has been sent to you on email. Always check out for uh, uh, signs of phishing emails to you. One of them through reflecting in our training we had. One of them is check the domain of uh, the, the email address first of all. The email address has a domain. So in our case, it is oec.int. But someone can create a lookalike of oec.int uh, by just saying 0sint or 0sc.int, which looks more or less like oec.int, right? So someone sends you that email with such kind of impersonated domain, and then you'll be thinking like, yeah, this is him, I trust. Then you go ahead and action anything in that email or clicking any link in that email. Uh, thereafter, you're definitely going to cause uh, you know, a breach. By just simply clicking an email, you could cause a breach that can take the whole of the organization down. Yeah? So that's the brief uh, uh, story behind uh, uh, this chapter, and uh, the wisdom is, is that we should emphasize all employees need to improve. Yeah? They need to improve their cybersecurity hygiene and be vigilant. As I said before, do not rush. Be able to do your due diligence before you act on any kind of uh, uh, request sent to you over email. Especially most, especially nowadays, it's called the social engineering where it involves either the phone, you're called on a phone instructing you to do something, or either you've been sent an email to click on something, yeah? Someone can send you claiming they want to have a meeting with you, giving you a link to click to join the meeting. You end up clicking on a malicious link, which will compromise the whole uh, organization. I think that's briefly uh, from the three chapters I've chosen to be able to discuss uh, the book. And I'll hand over to uh, uh, Mr. Jaffet to be able to uh, give his reflections. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thanks, Mubarak, for giving an outlay of the whole scenario in the book. Now, particularly um, looking at the whole scenario, um, Alison and Sarah uh, kind of uh, models her story and stories from different um, organizations into a practical framework that can be adopted or used by organizations, particularly in securing their cyber security uh, uh, systems. Now, looking at all these scenarios and uh, how Alison Sarah describes and, and models the story uh, gives us an overview, particularly how we can translate those frameworks into an organization, particularly our organization, and looking at the brackets of what she describes in terms of giving the hierarchy of each and every professional employees and the whole organizational systems, then it requires that uh, all of us have to secure what is called cybersecurity hygiene and uh, cybersecurity culture by each and every employee. So looking at the story that he, br he brought uh, in the, the chapter summary uh, by looking at how the world behaves, particularly referencing to how earthquakes uh, takes forms in the current world, is that she describes that nobody or no instrument has particularly provided an accurate information on how earthquakes can be predicted and that the prediction can always be used by some fillers or indicators. 
that can only give an indication but cannot give direct information of what time it will happen, what magnitude it will be, and what are the lines or patterns that the earthquake will be able to take. And then uh, based on these, the only human that has nearly predicted uh, the formation of an earthquake uh, was somebody called Jim uh, Blacklad um, uh, in US. He was a county uh, geologist uh, surveyor. Now, what happened is that um, he used indicators like the high tide waves in the sea, and he also used um, the moving pattern of the animals and counted the number of animals that had disappeared from a particular region. And he also used the sign of the moon, the position of the moon. Now, using this particular system, um, Jim uh, particularly predicted that the magnitude that was going to happen in 1986 by the uh, happening of an earthquake was going to be uh, 6.7 magnitude. Now, when this earthquake uh, was predicted and documented by the US Department of Geology, it actually happened on that particular time framework that he had predicted, it happened within the magnitude that he had predicted. Now, based on all these factors, there has been geological seismic instruments that are being used by the US to predict whether that quake is going to happen. And none has ever predicted the accuracy that Jim predicted this with. Now, that tells you, and in reference to cybersecurity, that there is no any other prediction that can happen within an organization that a cybersecurity flaw is going to happen at this particular time, and this is the time that is going to happen, and this is the magnitude that it is, it is going to take. So what is the moral story of uh, uh, Alison uh, Sarah uh, conclusion about how earthquakes happen and how cybersecurity happens in, a, in the organization? Is that there is no prediction, and at each and every particular point, everybody must have the sixth sense just like the animal had have the sixth sense that an earthquake can be able to happen and they can be able to migrate from one place to another. So that that culture of the sixth sense can be put or incalculated within the organizational employees so that there can be a prevention of major catastrophe in terms of breaches, in terms of flaws, and in terms of uh, organization losing its credibility in terms of uh, these fatal happenings by the cybersecurity. So the moral of the story and using the wisdom framework that Alison gives based on the experiences, based on the stories, is that the cybersecurity and cybersecurity guards should start from the hierarchy. And she gives a hierarchical framework from uh, the different steps of organization based from the board. What is it that the board and the chief executive organ, uh, uh, of an organization can be able to do to safeguard uh, cybersecurity uh, flaws within the organization? And she gives particular questions, uh, patterns, and frameworks of what they need to do. And particularly, she asks questions that do the CEOs or the boards uh, have any discussions or meetings uh, in pertain to what would happen to the organization if a major catastrophe of uh, cybersecurity nature occurs. So he, she also gives indication that there should be time-to-time -time discussions, time-to-time -time analysis, and their role should also be in the placement of the budgets. Do they particularly give budgets uh, to the departments that are concerned with the cybersecurity uh, information management and all that, so that any major catastrophe uh, can be deterred if, if it occurs. At that level, then they should also be having a knowledge of how the organization information and cybersecurity structure is. And they should be knowledgeable of the IT infrastructure, the systems, how it works, who does what, and who is responsible for what at that hierarchical structures. Now, they also, um, uh, Alison also gives an indication of the role that uh, other players should be able to play like the finance and, and, and the procurement department in an organization. And she recommends that based on all these flaws and structures that can be able to, uh, to be deterred in an organization, the finance person should be able to assess 
and look at the assets of the organizations and uh, majorly particularly do an audit, carry out an audit within the organization systems and look at what is the loss that the organization can incur in case of a major cybersecurity catastrophe. If an OEC particularly disappears from, uh, from the prints of the internet and all that, what is the major loss that the organization is going to occur? So these audits should be carried by the finance department to look at the critical assets. If the server room or the servers or the computers or the devices that have been brought are all stolen or they all disappear from where they have been stored, what is the financial loss that the organization particularly undergoes based on, on this particular assessment? So this critical infrastructure should be assessed based on the framework that she gives that the organization should have a clear framework in terms of assessing the loss, assessing the magnitude, and assessing the financial implications of the IT systems uh, within the organization uh, in case a breach occurs or in, in case there is a cybersecurity flaw that has, has been experienced. Now, she further went she further goes ahead and, and also gives a scenario of how the HR department can be used to uh, uh, embolden or to give uh, the cybersecurity professionals within the organization a face. And it starts from, uh, from the recruitment in terms of how they should be able to get technical uh, people and, and uh, uh, particularly uh, what I can say is interview professionals, get professionals who understands the structures, who understands the hardware, and who understands the current trend of IT and technological innovations that happen day by day. And particularly, she gives uh, the framework of how the questions by the HR department in terms of hiring cybersecurity professionals should be handled. And she discourages some particular questions. For example, tell us about yourself for somebody who is coming to do a technical practicality uh, uh, audits for the cybersecurity information. So she gives a clear criteria of how organization can be used, the HR department can be used to particularly give clear guidance in the professional development, including the trainings, including the assessment, and including the hiring of key technical personnel who would be able to deter any cybersecurity flaws and all that. She also discusses the overall roles of the employees and discusses that uh, employees in the framework should be able to be trained regularly in terms of the new technological trends that comes within the cybersecurity areas and the new innovations that comes uh, within the sector. So she gives a framework on how the trainings can be able to be handled from time to time and who should be able to conduct these trainings, how the audits should be handled, and how the simulations should be able to be done so that any employee responsible or who breaches these particular uh, indications should be able to be responsible in that particular uh, sense. And looking at all these, then uh, we realize that the sense within which Alison, Sarah gives the framework for each and every employee is to inculcate the culture of cybersecurity. Everybody has to be responsible for his or her flaws within that area and have the sixth sense and even avoid the social engineering attempts like clicking, uh, on, uh, clicking on sites that are not really recommended or opening emails that they are really suspicious of. For example, uh, somebody can open for you an email that they have invited you for an event. And when you open that kind of a PDF, it could be the PDF that uh, contains the malicious and will be able to uh, siphon information from your system and take it outside. So it all starts with the employee. Then he also, uh, she also gives uh, a scenario of what uh, the IT department should now carry on, uh, carry as the major uh, deterrent mechanisms for any cybersecurity laws and says that uh, 
the department uh, should be able to provide training and guided simulations each and every time and maybe annual, annual audits to the uh, floors or to the areas that they feel uh, are capable of being handled uh, or being deterred or, or, or being breached by external entities. And particularly she focuses on the IT to be uh, proactive uh, in terms of uh, giving guidance to employees as form, in form of trainings, in form of guidance, in form of updates, in form of giving uh, levels of access to data and, and, and uh, password uh, uh, changes at, 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 at that end. So the employees uh, within the IT department carries the burden within the organization and to be able to guide the whole organization through its vision of cybersecurity, deterrence, uh, cybersecurity trainings and information, and also including uh, uh, sensitizing the staffs of the trends that are able to occur within the organization. So if we look at what Alison um, uh, gives in terms of the framework based on all these, then we realize that as, as an organization and based on her book and the storyline, then uh, we have um, a, a role to play in terms of how are we in calculating the lessons that she puts in, uh, in our day-to-day -day operations as organizations in order to deter any occurrence in terms of uh, cybersecurity flaws that can be able to, to, to happen. So based on that, uh, Mubarak, I, I think uh, that gives an overview in terms of how the author uh, describes her, her book, in terms of how she describes practicalities, and this, in terms of how she gives uh, recommendations in terms of a framework in, uh, in dealing with cybersecurity flaws or threats within an organization. Thank you. Much, uh, uh, Jafet, for that uh, insightful uh, comments and as well uh, an in-depth explanation of uh, uh, the content in the book. So just before I hand uh, this microphone to maybe uh, collect one or two questions, uh, just in summary of what uh, Jaffet elaborated on is um, the key principles of uh, uh, cyber security culture. So uh, through his uh, discussion, he mentioned about uh, every employee uh, plays a role yeah, in maintaining security. So that amounts to accountability. So every one of us is accountable within the organization to be able to um, uh, you know, practice a culture of uh, 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 security within the organization. He also mentioned about awareness, which um, uh, gives a task to the IT department to be able to uh, uh, be able to uh, give trainings to the staffs and uh, be able to uh, make the staff understand the common threats that uh, we might encounter in any day. Uh, so that they should be able to, you know, put the best practices to safeguard us from this kind of threats. There is also that part of compliance uh, that he mentioned. Uh, there are policies and regulations uh, in regards to IT and cyber security within any organization. And um, OEC as one should also have those kind of policies and regulations that should be shared to every staff and every staff should take that mandate to understand what they need to do and what they don't need to do, yeah, to be able to uh, safeguard uh, uh, the assets of uh, the organization. And lastly is uh, reporting. Now this is the key thing that uh, most employees shy out from, uh, is the aspect of reporting any kind of breach or any kind of suspicious activity. Someone will get an email maybe that looks true, true to them, but they feel if they report it, maybe they'll, they can be seen as someone who is not tech savvy, yeah? So uh, you get an, uh, a phishing email uh, inviting you for a meeting, yeah? Maybe the Eric guys, they interact a lot with, uh, uh, you know, the member states and all that and someone impersonates one of the member states and sends them an email and said, please, 
join this meeting, we need to discuss something further and maybe want to know the mandates of OEC. Uh, now you from Eric, not you know, understanding the whole aspect of or the intention of this person, you go ahead and click on any link. So the aspect is, is that you should have, you should develop the culture of reporting any kind of suspicious activity that you receive in your email. So talk about, you have not applied for any job, but someone tells you, I can give you a job better than what OEC is giving you now. Please click on this link to apply for the job. Trust me, if such an email comes to most of the staff, they will click on such a link, yeah? So it's, um, it's our mandate to be able to report such kind of uh, uh, emails that comes to us or something that we feel is suspicious or not good to be true that comes to us in our daily life, we should always be able to uh, report this. So having said those, uh, those are the key principles uh, that you should be able to, uh, you know, uh, have to put yourself accountable to make sure one of it is accountability, be compliant to the IT regulations, be able to report, yeah, and all that. So discussing all that gives you a highlight of what are the key principles of uh, cybersecurity. Thank you very much, guys. You've done a fantastic job uh, drawing our attention, and I think this follows you the training that you, you did uh, a week or so ago. I think this is something that uh, we have to, to deal with on a daily basis. We have to keep it at the back of our mind. I happen to uh, be heading a, a, a division in the UN some time back, and we were approaching the Financing for Development Conference, which is a group of about 4,000 people from the United Nations coming to meet here in Addis Ababa. And on the eve of this conference, we woke up one morning and the website was gone, replaced with porn and all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So your guy, my guys, which is your counterparts, had to really get cracking. Uh, they thought they had actually put all the, 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 the boundaries and, and built up walls so that not, nobody could. But there's tech-savvy people who, despite all the effort, can still penetrate and cause this kind of havoc. Now, my question is um, related to AI. Where do you see the role of artificial intelligence in all this? Is, is it a good thing, is it a bad thing? Could artificial intelligence trick the, the website or the computer and let you know, the, whatever password be thrown away or open to the public, in your opinion? So is it a good thing or a bad thing? First of all, it's a, a good thing. Uh, because um, AI uh, triggers uh, what are called the uh, positives in terms of large dat uh, data sets. Now, particularly, AI can, can be used in anything, particularly to do such extendable searches and give you a prediction of what may happen or may not happen. And depending on how you're using it, then it can be able to give you um, what are called the, uh, the positives. Now, there are also the bad sides of AI in terms of giving you the, uh, what are called the false negatives. And uh, AI used wrongly or used by any malicious person can be able to get or retrieve whatever they or pretend to, uh, to get. And, and based on the security and, and analyzing it, based on the security issue is that um, uh, using AI to uh, particularly breach uh, cybersecurity issues is something that is ongoing and a lot of research is being done on it uh, and it can be able to predict the patterns of even your password uh, where I can be able to predict that uh, Jim O1234 and use those particular patterns and train it, train it to some extent until it predicts the right one. So using AI to project a bad thing means that you're going to get to use it badly and you're, it's just like hacking or cyber 
hacking or, or being a, ha ha a hacker. So it depends on the level to which AI is being manipulated because it uses the human uh, kind of data sets that have been trained, that have been filtered to produce results that you want. So based on the level, it can either be good or it can be bad in that sense. Uh, thank you, thank you, Jaffet, uh, for that reflection. I would also add uh, that um, AI, as he mentioned, has uh, the two sides. There is a bad side and the good side of AI. Now, let's talk about the good side of AI. Now, in uh, recent trends, there are tools that have been developed, and they use AI to be able to safeguard our systems. So there are systems that are programmed to be able to predict or to be able to detect any kind of malicious activity coming into our, uh, our systems or maybe uh, our infrastructures. So that's one good part of the AI, but a lot of it is the bad. Why? Because one, uh, a young hacker, someone who is still in elementary can use AI to learn hacking. Yeah, in just one night, someone can learn how to hack using an AI tool, yeah? And uh, again, AI, as he mentioned, there are tools that can, you know, run a series or a thousand or millions of passwords in just one second. So should your password be among those passwords that have been breached, it will take this person one microseconds to get your password. Why? Because they have used AI to run through all the, it matches, it tries one, two, three, and this is done in a very fast manner that the AI is used to, you know, guess your password. So that's the, again, uh, uh, the negative <laughs> aspect of AI. But of course, in every uh, negative or positive, there should always be one person who is ahead to be able to fix this. Much as we know the hackers, they are always one step ahead of us. As uh, for us in the organization, we are looking at defending. Yeah, We are defending against what comes up. But now for them, they are one mile ahead of us to be able to identify some of the loopholes that we have in our system using AIs. Yeah? <coughs> So that's briefly uh, uh, what I can be able to respond to you, that uh, AI has two sides, the positive and the bad, but of course the negative is a lot that we need to have, uh, you know, ample time and the smartest guys around to be able to be ahead of the hackers. Yeah, so that's uh, uh, what I can uh, add to what Jafet has said. Uh, I would like to echo my uh you know, appreciation for the simplification because uh, you presented it in a very simple and uh, easily understandable uh, fashion. Uh, so, so I have uh, a layman's, you know, question, uh, may, maybe questions rather. One is you, you describe the hackers as cyber criminals. So can we say that we can have uh, their profile, because uh, who, who are the cyber criminals? Can, can we come up with a kind of profile? Uh, my second question is, what could be the possible motives? Uh, are they uh, economic, uh, you know, you know uh, uh, or other motives? Can we describe the possible motives for uh, uh, this type of activity? And the third one, and most uh, probably the most important one is, don't they leave a kind of footprint? Because uh, the way you talked is, you know, these people are anonymous, wouldn't be able uh, to get to them. Uh, we can't hold them accountable. So is there no a footprint in cyber criminality? Thank you. Uh, your first question was about uh, cyber criminals, who these people are. Can we profile them? Now, these cyber criminals, they're in different categories. One could be what you call an APT. These are nationwide kind of, a state 
organized criminals. So let's take a scenario like currently what is happening between uh, Ukraine and uh, Russia. Russia has invested a lot in making sure they get very talented cyber criminals to be able to, uh, you know, cause havoc within Ukraine and people supporting Ukraine. That's why today you hear a lot of cyber uh, threats or uh, data breaches in the United States, United States because the United States is behind, or maybe the EU is behind Ukraine, yeah? So uh, these cyber criminals, as we profile them, they, of course, one of them, as I said, is uh, the state-sponsored, and then they are this what we call the red uh, hat. The red hat, these are just people hackers who are out there to cause any kind of malicious havoc to anyone. They have no target. Whoever they can hack, they will hack. And their intentions, as you asked, was one of them is financial gain. So um, of recent days, you hear of maybe a company or an organization's data has been hacked, breached, and then they will ask you to pay for a ransom. So that's the financial uh, aspect or the financial gain that these hackers uh, look into. And report has shown that now organizations spend over billions, over 10 billions and above on, first of all, be able to get the best tool they can use to be able to protect their systems. But again, they spend a lot in paying for ransoms to be able to get back their data to be able to get back their systems so that they can run uh, their operations within the company. And then I also mentioned about data breach. They are mostly interested in your data. With their data, they can do anything they want. One is to defame, yeah, to tarnish a reputation. So say I am a competitor of Ethio Telecom, I would hire a hacker to hack Ethio Telecom and get all the data from Ethio Telecom about their subscribers and give it to me. So I have the data. What can I do with the data? I can start spamming them with, you know, texts. I can spam them with emails to be able to market my products and all this. So data is a very, very important asset in today's digital world. Yeah. So. Another uh, uh, gain that these hackers look for is generally the, the ones I mentioned, but today their emphasis is on financial gain. Yeah? Besides reputation, getting access to your systems and all that, uh, the larger extent is the financial gain that uh, they get from. And then your last question is about um, whether there is no footprint. A smart hacker will never leave a footprint in your servers. During the, or what we call in the framework of how hackers, it has been analyzed that there, there is a framework that it takes for, an hack, for a hacker to be able to successfully breach your system. One of them is they do what we call reconnaissance. Reconnaissance is just to find information about your system. After they find information about your system, they go to the next level to be able to uh, find out exploits. Exploits are vulnerabilities into your system. So if they find that again, they'll go ahead and now uh, uh, develop what we call payloads. Payloads are what they will use to be able to bridge you. One of them is sending you an email where by any instance, if you click on the email, you're already uh, hijacked. Yeah, And then the last part of a smart hacker will not leave up uh, what you call a footprint in your servers. How do they do it? They make sure they wipe out everything. The, uh, it's only uh, on rare occasions that you find maybe this person is just trying to, you know, he's trying his best to get into your system. Yeah? The moment he gets into your system, he gets excited, excited and goes and announces that I've breached OEC, not knowing they left a footprint. But a smart hacker will go back into your system and delete all the logs. Logs are simply like information about who connected to your system, where is this person 
is, what is the IP address of this person and all that. So this information, these hackers goes back and they delete it. And once it's deleted, it's very hard for you to know who did the action. Not until maybe the hacker goes on dark web, we call it dark web, where they sell unforbidden things. One of them could be your data that they have uh, exfiltrated. So that is where you'll know that, okay, it's this hacker that hacked me when they're selling out your information. Or you'll only know when um, the hacker puts your system on ransom and then they say, please send 10 billion to this account by this time, else you'll uh, lose your system or your reputation will be damaged and all that. So they will definitely give you an account that you can trace back to and know who exactly this person is. So that's the bit of how you can trace a footprint of who hacked your system. But otherwise, in most cases, the first thing the IT will do is do a forensic into your system. And if it's a smart hacker who wipes out this information, the IT will not know what exactly happened and who did it. Yeah, so that's uh, briefly uh, uh, my reflection or answers to your questions. If Jeff has some uh, uh, inputs as well, can be able to add. All right, Prof, uh, thanks for your question. And uh, maybe basically just to make it understandable a little bit is that uh, there are ethical hackers and not all hackers are bad. So if <laughs> so that that has been the basic and uh, it is a, a dilemma even among the professionals or even the universities doing the trainings of whether there is really ethical hacking. But I can tell you that there is the ethical hacking part of it. Just like you can train a doctor and a doctor can decide to eliminate whoever he wants or she wants. So Ethical hacking in the basis of the professionalism sense means that, uh, for example, if I'm a bank, uh, just like the way, the way they do it in Kenya, uh, banks organize a hackathons for students to come and try to break their systems and maybe detect the vulnerabilities that exist within the banking systems. So you find that at the end of the day, they'll be able to know that this particular bank has been hacked, they have been able to release uh, these and these millions of money and send it elsewhere. So they will be able to employ or document such kind of scenarios and employ this particular person or an individual into their banking to be able to safeguard and identify vulnerabilities. And most governments also do this. They employ individuals with high-tech uh, capability to be able to deter their critical systems, critical military wares, to be able to see where the vulnerability is. So that is what defines an ethical hacker. But in some scenarios, you can be an ethical hacker today, but the next time you can be a dangerous hacker. So that's why the professional boundary of ethical hacking and dangerous hacking cannot be defined. For example, the recent protests in Kenya, where ministers or mere MPs who voted for the financial bill that was in contention, you find that some of the government employees who are employed to defend or to provide protection to the critical systems releases this particular individual data including your medical report at the hospitals, including your family, wife's number, and the clandestines. They can be able to do that. They produce your pay slip. They produce everything and then flood it in the, into the internet. So you find that all your information, including personal medical reports, have been flooded with the, uh, have been sent to the internet to the people that are not really uh, privy to this kind of information. So it begs the question whether these ethical hackers or these professional people who have been employed by the government institutions are acting within the professionalism that they have been employed with. And then they, they also deter the footprint. So it's not able to be able to profile them and maybe show that this is the kind of the person that releases or released this particular sensitive information from the government portals or government database to individuals. So it happens in that particular layer. So it's hard, difficult, 
and confusing to always profile and know who is a good person and who is a, a bad person in the hacking profession. To McAfee, yeah. the creator of the antivirus. antivirus. Yeah. He started off as a hacker. He, originally, he was a big hacker. And somewhere he went, you know, he reached the, the, the road to what is it, Damascus. And he made a change and he realized that he could make more money by selling these anti, anti uh, hacking things. But he started off like that. Yeah. So I don't know whether that falls under the category of a good hacker, but there you go. Uh, let me uh, uh, give my reflection on that as well. Uh, so. Um, it's not only in, in, uh, in cyber security or IT, but we have ever seen trends now that people cause, people bring in sickness so that they can sell the medicine, right? So it happens even in the pharmaceutical. It's similar to uh, the cyber security or digital world now, that you cause an issue and then you develop the solution to be able to sell out. And that's what uh, Dr. Jim has just said about McAfee. He started as a hacker. So the category is, is that one puts on a red hat. And then at some time, maybe he feels he has developed a tool that can cause havoc to your computers. For him not to be profiled as a bad person, he will turn back to a white hacker and then develop a protection for it. And that's how the antivirus has come. Yeah? So they develop, uh, you know, uh, a solution to fix something they have developed. It's business, yeah? So uh, as you said, it's uh, really hard to know whether he's a bad person is a, or is a good person, but the whole intention is they want, they are making business, yeah? And uh, uh, Jaffet also talked about ethical hackers. So we as cybersecurity personnel in an organization, we are entitled to find loopholes. You're not there to hack, but you're supposed to hack to be able to identify the loopholes and then fix it. So that's the aspect of ethical hacking. Yeah? We are supposed to do it to identify the vulnerabilities and be able to identify uh, the loopholes and then give advisories to the, whoever is developing an app or whoever is protecting a system should be able to know that ABC is one of the vulnerabilities that exist in the system and has uh, needs one or two, three things to be able to uh, fix this issue. So that's what the ethical hacking aspect is. Yeah, so that's uh, my brief reflection. Thank you very much uh, from my side as well. I think I missed the training on cybersecurity that Jim was referring to, so this is a good supplement uh, for us. And I think the importance of this uh, cybersecurity uh, culture you were mentioning as well uh, cannot be overestimated. It is so important, and our Secretary General also uh, has been encouraging recently, as you might have seen, the use of uh, communication tools provided by the organization, uh, and because using other uh, channels of communication like private emails, whatever, they also pose, I think, uh, a risk for the organization. Uh, so from, from uh, my side, uh, taking the opportunity of the book, you briefed even more broadly. I appreciate it very much. Um, I have one question about the spam emails. At, uh, as you mentioned to Eric account, now it is the map, uh, it's called, but uh, that account receives a lot of uh, spams, for instance, some of them, are looking more business related. Some of them are totally, you can guess, uh, they are not uh, of substance. How do you recommend those spam emails are handled? Uh, we should delete them just right like that or open and see what is inside, kind of? Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your question and reflections and your appreciation for this. And uh, uh, just in uh, uh, previous weeks, we had the training and uh, one of your employee, I think, uh, from Eric reported that to us because we gave them the chance to give us uh, any kind of reflection or experiences, whether they have been hacked before or they have got. So they reported to us that they get a lot of phishing emails. And uh, through our demonstrations, we are able to give them a guidelines on how they can report a phishing email. So uh, Proton email helps or give, gives us that functionality within your email 
I can just describe it as if you open the email and then you find three horizontal dots on the, uh, let me say, the left corner side, when you click on uh, the three dots, you'll be able to see a hook with a red uh, icon telling you report fishing. So that is what you can do as a, a reporting aspect for the IT to know that a domain that sent you an email is a phishing email. So what they can do is they need to go and action it by blocking it. They need to block the domain from the servers or our email servers such that this person will not be able to send this same email to any other person. Yeah. So that is uh, one aspect of how we can be able to mitigate uh, uh, phishing. And then secondly, during the training also we managed to give them detailed uh, guidelines on how to identify a phishing email. One of it is I echoed before was looking at the domain, yeah? So if it's, you're thinking maybe uh, an email came from one of the government offices, say a, mem a member state. Most of the government offices have their email something.gov, right? So if you receive an email from a Gmail account telling you this person is a, a government office, you should raise a, a flag about this email. That is the first thing you need to identify in uh, phishing emails. Again, secondly, in, an, uh, in a phishing email, you find the person will give you an attachment to, to, to download or will give you a link to click on. So those two things are the dangerous th things in the, what? In, the, in the phishing email that can, by simply clicking a link or downloading an attachment, an attachment can have, as I mentioned before, can have a malware. The moment you open this uh, attachment or PDF, uh, a software will be installed inside your computer. We call it a malicious software. And what the intention of this malicious software is one, to cause havoc to your computer, slow it down, take your data, pick all the data you have on your cookies or browser. Maybe you have saved your password and all, all this will be uh, uh, sent back to the attacker. So uh, again, uh, the phishing email, how you can uh, be able to identify it is, let's say the email looks so true that you feel it's something true. What you can do is before clicking on any email, you hover on the link. Usually it's highlighted in blue, underlined, yeah? So when you, you, when you put your cursor on that link, it will give you a detail of what the domain or what the link is that you're going to click on. So by identifying or looking at the domain of this website that you're clicking on, does it relate to an organization's domain? Does it relate like something that looks genuine? If it's not, if it's suspicious, do not click on the link, yeah? Please go ahead and report that to uh, the IT department. I think that's uh, briefly what I can uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, phishing emails and how you can uh, action your reporting and identifications. Thank you.